we're recording now. Um, we'll this meeting is being there. recorded. Oh. Okay, I just got the announcement. So, um, anyhow, good evening, everybody who's here. Um, I'm glad to be here. My name is Marla Jacquino, and I work at Foundational Concepts Physical Therapy in Kansas City. Um, I'll be your host tonight, and my colleague Julia Foster, also a PT at Foundational Concepts, will be with us tonight, but not speaking. However, she'll be hosting uh, another free event on June 22nd at 7 p.m. called Mastering Menopause Bone Health. Um, we hope to see you there then as well and let your friends know about it. This isn't a prerequisite, so uh, you can come to that if you haven't seen this webinar. Um, I am also going to leave some time at the end for some questions if you have them. Um, but if you do feel like you need something clarified right away, Julia will try to be watching the chat for any questions that you might have um, that come up and she'll try to help you there. Um, also to let you know that the information in this uh, presentation is for educational purposes only, and it doesn't substitute for advice from your medical provider. Um, now I'm gonna start the slideshow here. It's good to see everybody. So this is pelvic health through menopause. We're gonna be focusing on pelvic health. Um, the names on here, I'm the one at the bottom and I'll talk about myself a little bit more here. Uh, and Sarah Dominguez and Jennifer Cumming are both physical therapists. They're amazing and they're the founders of Foundational Concepts and they created quite a bit of this content on here on this slideshow as well. And I'll talk more about our contact information at the end. Um, so I want to tell you just a little bit about myself. Um, I've been a pelvic uh, physical therapist for 22 years. Um, I have a master's degree in physical therapy, and I did a fellowship in orthopedic manual therapy for four years. I became interested in pelvic floor therapy around a decade ago because I was treating a lot of perimenopausal and postmenopausal women that wasn't really aware of that so much, but I was treating them for back and or hip pain and actually even prior to that, not even just 10 years ago. But after a few sessions, some ladies would tell me, um, wow, one of the added benefits of physical therapy for their back or hip or leg was no longer having to pee their pants, which was really sometimes the first time they would reveal that they'd had urinary incontinence. Um, I then immediately got the connection between the relief of back pain, also getting improved core function and the improvement in their urinary incontinence. And that's where um, my learning journey started and it really escalated from there. Um, this was without teaching a single Kegel, okay? Um, I then started taking some specialized pelvic floor courses, um, eventually started a pelvic floor program at the clinic where I used to practice and then um, did nicely with that. And then a year ago, I made the decision to come work at Foundational Concepts. Um, this, um, this webinar is to inform you about menopause and the changes that can happen around the pelvis and the pelvic floor, and some of the things that we as pelvic floor PTs can do to help to make your journey an easier and more informed one. Um, I'll share with you a little bit about my experience going through menopause, and it's why I felt inspired to give this talk. Um, I have two older sisters. I'm the youngest of four, and I looked to them to lead the way uh, through menopause. Um, and neither of them had gone through menopause when I started in my late 40s to have many um, different complaints that made my work and home life difficult and painful. And I was going to doctors and getting a clean bill of health, but I was frustrated because I was suffering. And I thought back then that menopause was mainly hot flashes. I didn't really know about what a huge impact it had on other symptoms, um, on, other sim on other body systems, excuse me. Um, a year after going through that horror or ordeal, when all those symptoms started, I realized that I had gone through menopause. And I figured that my symptoms must have been from hormonal changes, but um, it was really later when I learned more about it that I, I, I got that connection. And now it all makes sense. Um, it wasn't until I learned about pelvic health PT that I had a real idea of the scope of what I was going through and what questions I should have been asking my doctors and how I could have better advocated for myself. So I wish I'd seen this webinar way back then so that I had had more information and then I didn't feel so lost and confused. And I probably would have made a few different decisions than, than I did, but I, I got through it. Um, 
So now I'm going to talk about the objectives of this course. Um, we'll talk about the anatomy of the vulvovaginal structures and the pelvic musculature. Um, we'll talk about perimenopause and menopause, um, what this means for our tissues, um, discuss some common symptoms and concerns, um, talk a little bit about hormone replacement therapy, and then of course conclude with talking about specialty physical therapy. So here's a little anatomy shot for you. This is sort of a, almost like a gyno view of the pelvic floor. I'll orient you a little bit. So these are the thighs. Let's imagine that this person is undressed and they have their feet up in stirrups, um, which by the way, we don't use in pelvic floor physical therapy. So no scary stirrups and no, no um, clamps or anything like that. Um, so this is the pubic bone. This would be the tailbone here. This is the anus. Um, and the, this is the whole um, vulvovaginal area. Um, the role of the, the vulvovaginal area, the vulva, is to protect the sexual organs, the urinary opening, the vestibule, and the vagina. So this is the urinary opening right here. All this tissue right here inside the labia minora is the vestibule. These are the, this is the labia minora, the inner lips, and this is the labia majora out here, the outer lips. And this is the clitoris, which Everybody kind of thinks it's right here because that's where the locus of all the sensation is, but it actually is pretty big. It's like a, it's back behind the skin here and it's like a big wishbone. So that's why we can get a lot more um, sexual stimulation from the, around this area. It's not just right here, okay? And this is all the center for se sexual response because of what I just showed you there. The, this whole area stretches to accommodate childbirth. Those tissues are meant to do that. And these structures are all affected by hormone changes at menopause. Um, so that's your little quick anatomy here. And there's going to be a little bit more here. The vagina, we've all heard of that. I will orient you to this photo. This person is, it's like a slice through the middle, um, right down the middle where the belly button is. This person is facing the right of the screen. That's the inner thigh. And um, this is where about the belly button is. <clears throat> this is the, rep, the, the anus. So here's the, the uterus. And um, this is the vagina right here, the bladder, the urethra where urine comes out and the rectum and then the anus where we have our bowel movement from. And this is an ovary in the fallopian tubes. The vagina uh, has several functions. It is the passive for passage for menstrual flow. This is where the uh, menstrual tissue then sloughs off uh, about monthly and then comes down through here. It also accommodates the penis during intercourse. It's the birth canal, so it expands to allow a baby to pass through. Um, it also allows access to the cervix and permits examination of the uterus and the ovaries. Um, it also has a role of preventing bacteria from entering the, entering the body by keeping good bacteria at the right levels. And it does this by having a naturally acidic environment and that, um, that kills some of the bad bacteria. And we'll, we'll note later that there are some changes that take place there that make us maybe a little bit more prone to have um, bacterial infection later in life, just to be aware of it. This is the pelvic floor musculature. I will again orient you to these because they're just kind of in your face and sort of really close up. Uh, this is again, like a gynecology view of it. With, if we have our leg up in stirrups and out of the way, this is where the pubic bone would be. This is kind of around where the tailbone would be. These are the two buttocks and all this skin and fatty tissue has been taken away for this photo so that we can actually see the muscle that lies underneath. Um, the pelvic floor musculature, um, we have all these little strips. All these are the external or the first layer of muscles up here. And this is what we think of as like the urinary and sexual function muscles. And then these muscles back here are called the levator ani. Um, these are like have more of a support function and they support, they also attach to the low back a little bit too. So these muscles, they support the pelvic organs. They have a sphincteric role and sphincteric just means they close off the urethra where urine comes out. They um, also keep the vagina um, closed when we're not passing a baby through there or having a, a vaginal exam and closes off the anus to keep us from losing um, 
uh, gas when we don't want to and stool when we don't want to. Um, it also has a sexual function. It functions for arousal, orgasm, and then the relaxation afterwards. It had, they have a stability function. Um, they provide a stable pelvis, lumbar spine and hips. And um, interesting thought with that stability is when we have poor stability in other parts of our core, like our hips and our abs and our back, um, the pelvic floor muscles might try to, to take over for that role and they can get tight and, and stiff and, and have pain too. So there's just a lot of complexity there in the human body that I find fascinating. They also have a sump pump role, and that just means that they promote venous and lymphatic flow, so moves fluids through the area. Um, for best function, the pelvic floor muscles need to be able to fully contract, fully relax, and uh, fully lengthen to do their job well. Some people can't fully relax or lengthen, and that can cause pelvic floor issues, as can the ability to um, not be able to get a good or strong contraction. Um, in pelvic floor PT, we can assess those things and teach you how to return to better, better use of those pelvic floor muscles. Let's talk about um, some definitions here. Perimenopause is the transition between the childbear childbearing and the post-childbearing years, and this is whether you've had children or not. Um, the average age is in the 40s. First, we see a drop in progesterone, and then since the progesterone drops, we that estrogen dominates because there's a higher uh, amount of that in comparison to the progesterone we used to have. Um, and we can see things like more PMS-like symptoms, um, mood swings, tender breasts, and bloating. Um, and then estrogen starts to go down, and then when that goes down, more changes can occur. We can get hot flashes, memory loss, heart palpitations, migraines, vaginal dry, dryness, decreased desire, and pain. And that pain can be anywhere. <laughs> um, musculoskeletal headaches, uh, pelvic floor pain. Um, and let me tell you that this isn't a guarantee that you're going to get all of these symptoms, okay? Um, you might get a few, you might get some, some might go away, some might not. Uh, and a lot of these changes come on at first and they can go away later because our body is trying to find, we're used to a certain hormone balance overall. And when things drop, uh, it gets us out of our, our homeostasis and we, we do feel those symptoms. Um, late perimenopause, both estrogen and progesterone are very low and many of the symptoms actually may back off, but others um, can last into the menopausal years and past, okay? Um, some women have almost no symptoms and others have just one or two. And some women will have many symptoms and this list of symptoms isn't exhaustive either. Um, they can resolve or last a long time. Every woman is different. And also there are things that can um, be done about symptoms if you kind of know what to look for and, and you advocate for yourself. So now menopause. Um, most men, women reach menopause by the age of 55 on average. Um, the changes that we have vary depending on our genetic makeup, our nutrition, our disease history, and the levels of natural estrogen that are present in our body already, because everybody's a little different. Um, menopause is defined as a sensation of menstrual periods for one year. We can also have like an induced menopause, which is where we have uh, hysterectomy with the removal of the ovaries. And that's where you go immediately into menopause. Um, some people unfortunately have to go through that. And the symptoms are uh, much more sudden and severe because your body's having to just go through that deletion of the, of the hormones pretty quickly. But there are a lot of treatments for that. And also um, some people, especially with certain cancers, can't do um, hormone replacement stuff but doctors know there's a lot of different um, medications we can try and um, therapies that can we try to, to give you some symptomatic relief. Um, also a hysterectomy without removal of the ovaries, you'll see a slight drop in estrogen, but the ovaries are still there to give you your estrogen and they don't really call that menopause. You still have to just kind of wait and go through the stages like everybody else that has ovaries. Um, I recommend 
keeping a good log of your cycles and your symptoms so that you have that there to talk to your clinician and explore treatment options. And then you'll also know when you've gone through menopause, especially if you're irregular or you don't have periods because of the type of birth control you're on or any of the different things that any of us are going through. Some of the signs of menopause, and this is not, again, not exhaustive, are mood swings, memory loss and concentration issues. And no, that doesn't mean you're going through early dementia. It could just be some signs of menopause, okay? Um, hot flashes, that's the only one I thought people had, and that's the only one I didn't get, I swear. Um, insomnia, vaginal dryness and infections, um, which is, you know, I talked about that, um, that acidic lining of the vagina, which protects us from infection. Um, UTI, which means urinary tract infections, those also can happen a little bit more frequently. Some people don't get them until menopause. Um, we can get urinary frequency or incontinence. Um, and we can have bowel issues, either constipation or diarrhea type things. Um, we get dry skin, hair and nails, and we can have decreased sexual desire and pain with sex. Um, Joint pain is also a symptom of menopause, and we treat that in our clinic as well. Uh, like I told you at the introduction, I was seeing postmenopausal women with joint pain who had resolution of their urinary incontinence with treatment that was not directed at the pelvic floor. Um, many of these women have had issues since they had delivered their babies decades earlier and had just been called, oh, there they are, welcome to motherhood. Um, things are changing now, and they're offering more things for women post baby and it's not, we're not accepting that, you know, that we um, lose urine after we have a baby. That, that shouldn't be accepted. When we treated the core and hips of people, these pel the pelvic floor also benefited and they got some help that they never knew they could ask for. And I'm hoping that with this uh, class tonight that you'll learn how to ask for a little bit more because you'll know that there are some solutions out there. Um, so, Anyway, um, these symptoms are common but not normal and we treat these things and we help many women to find relief. So let's talk a little bit about the roles of estrogen and progesterone, they are many. Um, estrogen roles are accelerating metabolism and we will see a, a lowering of our metabolism with, uh, when going through menopause. Um, it increases fat stores it stimulates endometrial growth, which is the tissue inside of the, the uterus. It also stimulates uterine growth, thickens the vaginal wall and increases lubrication in the vagina. It increases bone formation. Um, it reduces bowel motility and it increases clotting, clotting factors in the, um, it's responsible for ovulation. It maintains sexual desire and mood and, and also helps stabilize our mood. And it lowers LDL and triglycerides and is also responsible for some vasodilation. Um, the roles of progesterone are, it's the hormone of pregnancy. So it allows the body to accept pregnancy. It improves the nervous system synaptic functioning, which means it improves memory and cognition. Um, it relaxes smooth muscle. It has an anti-inflammatory role and it has a role in pancreatic function which is why um, we have gestational diabetes with women that are pregnant. And we, get some, we can get some blood sugar issues and some insulin resistance when we go through menopause too. Um, we see here that when estrogen is lower, the LDL or bad cholesterol goes up, okay? Because estrogen tends to lower those things and it also causes vasodilation. So vasodilation goes, our vasoconstriction goes up and that is partially why women prior to menopause, when they have the benefits of these two things, um, have a lower risk of dying of heart disease than men, but after menopause, their risk of uh, dying of heart disease is equal to that of men. So we just have to be on the eye for that, taking care of ourselves. So now I'm gonna talk about atrophic tissue changes in the vulvovaginal area with menopause. So that's why I went through those slides earlier. Atrophic means like atrophy, so the tissues get thinner. Um, so we get, we see a lot of this in pelvic floor therapy. We will have the connected tissue and fat deposits under the skin get reduced all over the body. Um, the skin thins and becomes drier on the 
vaginal area and over, all over the body. The vestibule, that area that's in that's around the vagina, that becomes thin and dry. The labia become flatter and they shrink, and the vaginal opening becomes smaller because everything's getting going, getting a little bit of atrophy. Our pubic hair will gray and fall out, and the folds in the vaginal wall flatten, and the walls of the vagina thin and become pale. And you can't usually see that, but as a pelvic floor therapist, you can look in there and see the color changes. Um, the vaginal pH rises, which means that the acidity goes down and then bacteria, the good bacteria disappear. And we tend to have a, more of a growing area for bad bacteria to happen. We also get thinning of the urethral and bladder base tissue, which then makes us more prone to bladder infections and, and urinary tract infections and things like that. Um, so the things that can happen with all these changes are that washing and wiping um, in the pelvic floor area can become uncomfortable. Sex can be painful or unpleasant. Um, and we do stress that it's important to remain sexually active. It's like exercise for your pelvic floor. Um, sex with or without a partner is good and it can help maintain vaginal health. Um, so be aware that that's like a really good thing for you. And um, if it's painful for you, we can help you with that in, in, in pelvic floor therapy as well. We have a thing called atrophic vaginitis, and I'll talk about that little, a little bit more. The clitoris happily remains unchanged. Um, we can get urinary symptoms or infection and topical estrogens can help with these tissue changes quite a bit. Topical estrogen is where we take like an estrogen cream or pill um, and it's applied to the vaginal tissues themselves. And it's uh, such a low dose that it's not considered hormone replacement therapy. And it's really pretty safe. Um, and some people can't use those. And we'll talk about that. And there are other options for them too that we can recommend as well. Or your doctor, you can talk to your doctor about too. So let's talk about urinary incontinence. It's so prevalent um, and it's caused by several, it can be a combination of one or many of these things. Um, muscle weakness, the tissue changes that I talked about, poor support for the pelvic organs because then if they're not supported well, then they don't hold things as well. Weight gain and general decreased conditioning. And I wanna go back to this weight gain and tell you um, that even if you have some weight gain, which is very common with menopause, don't let that keep you from getting help um, from pelvic floor therapy. You do not have to lose weight to be able to improve urinary incontinence. We treat pregnant women that gain a lot of weight in their bellies really quickly. And there's a lot of pressure down on the pelvic floor. And we can work with women that have, have a baby in their belly and teach them how to stabilize and not lose as much urine. So um, please don't let that be a, a barrier for you. Okay. I just put that in there so that you knew that that's also a little bit of a factor. Um, three kinds of urinary incontinence in general, we have stress urinary incontinence, urge urinary incontinence, or mixed urinary incontinence. And stress urinary incontinence is where like coughing, sneezing, or running, or jumping on a trampoline will cause us to lose some urine, either a little or a lot. Urge urinary incontinence is where uh, let's say you come home and you put the key in the door and all of a sudden you're starting to lose a little urine or you hear water running and you start to pee your pants or you um, start to walk to the, to the bathroom and all of a sudden it starts to come out before you can get to the toilet. Um, and mixed urinary incontinence is a combination of the two and we see that a lot and we treat all of that and it's, uh, it's, it's resolvable. Um, pelvic physical therapy is a huge help in stopping incontinence. Um, it's, our, it's kind of my bread and butter. We evaluate the pelvic musculature, the tissues and the bony structures. We do an internal vaginal exam. That's the gold standard. Again, if you don't want an internal vaginal exam for whatever reason, we respect your, your body autonomy and your consent. And we can find ways that don't involve you having to undress to see how those muscles are working. Um, and we do some biofeedback of the pelvic floor musculature uh, to teach you how to do your, your exercises properly and how to get that good contraction, relaxation and lengthening. Um, and we develop an individual treatment plan for you. 
We look at your bladder habits, your bowel habits, and your diet, and your general health habits, and your other core muscles to make sure that everything's working to help, um, help you maintain continence and regain continence. Um, so what are normal bladder habits? Like what's normal, what's not? Um, I'm going to orient you here. This is a little bit easier to see. I think this person's facing left. This is around the belly button here. This is the spine, like here's the tailbone down here. This is the, the, the colon, the rectum, and this is the anus where, um, where we have a bowel movement from. Uterus again, vagina, uh, bladder, urethra, where we urinate from. So the pubic bone, in between the pubic bone and the tailbone, this little sling-like thing here, it's actually kind of bowl-shaped, is um, pelvic floor muscle, okay? Um, now, what are considered normal bladder patterns? We put normal in quotations because everybody's maybe a little bit different. Um, you should, in, on average, void about five to seven times in a 24-hour period, about every two to three hours during the day. You shouldn't have to get up at night to void. Um, but over age, age 65, it's okay to get up once. We find that to be pretty common. Um, you shouldn't have to strain ever to start the flow of urine. That may be a sign that there's a problem and you should have that assessed. Um, your bladder can hold about two cups of urine. That's just kind of a fun fact. Um, and you should never go just in case. Um, this can train your bladder that it cannot wait. And that's one of the precursors to that, uh, that um, urge incontinence that, that we were talking about. So don't get into the habit of it, okay? So the mechanics of waiting, a little bit here of anatomy I couldn't resist. This is a, not a whole lot of body here. This is the bladder brain connection. This is the brain and then this is the spinal cord and these little things here are, are communication of the nerves. This is a bladder. This is the where the bladder, um, the urethra is, and then that little sling of pelvic floor muscle, we can kind of see that here, and it acts as a sphincter to close this off. So um, urine first fills the bladder, and the stretch, so these little arrows here show the bladder getting stretched, and it signals the brain that it's time for the bladder to empty, um, and then the bladder stretch signals, and so we signal the brain, and the bladder stretch signals the pelvic floor to contract, so that closes the bladder next so we don't lose urine, lose urine. And we get to the toilet and we sit down, the pelvic floor must relax. And then when this relaxes, the bladder will, as a kind of a reflex, will contract because it's all lined with muscle and then it empties out. Now we're going to talk about bowels. Um, some bowel concerns that we can have. Um, constipation or fecal incontinence can be a significant problems in menopause. Um, consistent straining to have bowel movements can be hard on the tissues, the organs, and the musculature of the pelvis and abdomen, and it perpetuates muscle dysfunction. So doing it more and more makes us better at doing it, and it's not functional, and we can work to change that, okay? Fecal incontinence is largely, again, like like uh, urinary incontinence due to muscle weakness, um, a bowel consistency that is not uh, good, and decreased rectal compliance and sensation at the anal sphincters. So a lot of little things that, that play into that. Retraining the pelvic musculature as well as rectal sphincter retraining using biofeedback back is very successful. So again, don't suffer in silence. Even if it's been a while, just tell somebody, tell your provider and see what can be done about that. So what are normal bowel habits? What's considered normal? Um, we like a consistent size and form of stool, kind of a smooth and easy to pass, not too small, not too big. Um, and not dry, but a little bit formed. It should be easily passed without straining, like gritting your teeth, holding your breath, turning red in the face, pushing down real hard. And daily to every other day, like three times a week, uh, is, is about the norm. There's some variation there. Mechanics of bowel movement. Many of you have probably seen the squatty potty ads, but this is really, it's not just a gimmick. A lot of things are. Um, uh, if you look here, I'm gonna show you the anatomy again. This person is facing to the left of the screen. This is the buttock. 
This is the sacrum and the tailbone. And this is the pubic bone. The person's cut in half. This is a thigh. This is where the thigh bends. You see, this is a bigger angle here. And this is a tighter angle. This is this is this guy, and this on the right is the guy on the right. And when we're just sitting or standing, the rectum, where the stool starts to come down, gets pulled by this little muscle called the puborectalis muscle forward so that there's a little angle there. And that keeps stool from just sliding straight down so that we can go about our day without feeling it in that rectal canal. It's really uncomfortable. It feels like you've got to go all the time. If we squat and get this angle up, and I think of like maybe early man pooped in the woods or something, um, this muscle gets put on a slack because of its anatomical attachment, and then it's a straight shot to the toilet. Keeps you from having to strain. Makes a big difference. And then the pelvic floor muscles still have to be able to relax, and that's trainable. The abdominals should be relaxed. No sucking in of your tummy or bracing of the stomach muscles. The jaw and mouth should be relaxed. No gulping in of your breath or tightly clenching your lips. Um, and you should finish with pelvic floor muscle contraction to improve your closing reflex. Just do a little Kegel at the end. Now, I promised this before. Um, the uh, atrophic vaginitis, that means atrophy, that thinning of the tissues, and then the, the irritation at the vagina, vaginitis. Here's a picture on the left of healthy vaginal tissue, like a side view, almost like under a microscope. And here's a picture on the right of what can, what, what starts to happen. It's caused by loss of estrogen, and that can't, that doesn't just happen in menopause. It can also happen postpartum with breastfeeding or in athletes that have low weight and high physical activity because fat on our bodies also stores estrogen, um, and we need that. Um, women who've had their ovaries removed or who's Ovaries do not work due to chemotherapy, radiation, or premature menopause. Um, some medications may cause atrophic vaginitis, Lupron and Danazol are some, low-dose contraceptive or progesterone-only contraceptives like Depo-Provera and Norplant can also drive a little bit of that. The vagina looks thin, smooth, and dry, and it's light pink to white. When we look at it, you'll see this, like, these, this whiteness here. Um, the pH is elevated. Again, that means it's lower acid and a culture will show white blood cells, absence of lactobacilli and presence of parabasal cells. Um, we can have vaginal discomfort, discomfort with wiping or washing or pain with intercourse. Those are our first signs of approaching menopause. And estrogen to the vaginal tissues is the only effective treatment to date. Um, again, I talked about the topical estrogen, but um, if... Uh, if you can't use that, there, are, there can be some other options to help you with the discomfort. So don't hesitate to ask for help with that and don't suffer in silence. So pain. Pain um, can occur because of vaginal discomfort, infection, or dryness. The muscles in the area begin to tighten in response to discomfort. It's like a reflexive thing we're trying to guard. And then they remain that way, and then they are unable to return to a healthy, relaxed state. And I told you the pelvic floor muscles need to be able to contract, relax, and lengthen, okay, for good function. So pain can drive a lot of the other issues, like the bowel and bladder issues, too. Um, there is psychology behind the effects of painful, painful intercourse, um, the weight it puts on a relationship and low desire or decreased arousal can become a vicious cycle and that cycle um, should be broken and it can be. Um, physical therapy for pelvic pain, pain with intercourse, pain with, with, um, with medical uh, appointments, having a vaginal exam, it's a gold standard for the treatment of this disorder and with uh, pain with intercourse, we work alongside with a physician and sometimes also a psychologist to help um, break that cycle. Um, I also want to add um, that too tight and tense or too weak of pelvic floor muscles can also contribute to back pain and decreased quality of life in menopause, and we can help there as well. Also, and I, I know I kind of harp on this, but joint pain can also work in with men can worsen with menopause. So don't hesitate to look into PT or talk to your doctor about this and don't needlessly suffer. Even if it's been years, there's, there's stuff that can be done about it. Sexual function, I'll talk about some definitions here. Um, 
we start with desire and that goes down with menopause. Um, our stage of life is also a very busy one during menopause, although I think everybody's lives seem to be busy these days. Uh, desire is driven by physical factors, like what we talked about with changes in the pelvic floor. Pain does not make us want to do anything with sex. Um, and also emotional factors, our sexual attitudes that we grew up with, our previous experiences, the environment you're in and the person you're with and your relationship. Arousal, um, we start to get aroused, we'll have desire first usually, um, and then we can start to get aroused and we'll get increased blood flow to the vulva and the vagina and muscle tension increases. Um, and then we'll get a plateau in that arousal and we'll start to get more swelling in the vaginal tissues. And then that all leads eventually to orgasm where we have contractions, like rhythmic contraction and relaxation of the pelvic muscles. And the pudendal nerve is the pathway for this sensation of orgasm. And then afterwards we get that relaxation, which is a return to our baseline state and blood drains from the genital area. So that's also, um, all those things are affected. And also, this is why it's really nice. You'll see that we have, we talk a lot about the muscles and blood flow here. And it's a great way to get some healthy blood flow into the vaginal tissues for um, more health in that area. It's like, it's exercise. Um, desire can go down during menopause because of the hormone changes, but you can also talk to your doctor about that. There are some things that can be done about that medically too. And also just not having pain will help if you're having discomfort. So brain changes with menopause. Um, we have some, we can have some cognitive decline, um, some mood changes, depression and anxiety can get worse in menopause, especially if you've had it younger, sometimes it can flare up again. To date, we have insufficient evidence to suggest that hormone replacement therapy can impact cognition and or dementia, but there may be some benefit to using estrogen for mood or depression. Um, exercise has been shown to do more for general mood and cognitive changes involving, uh, involved in aging. And exercise can be a lot of things. If you're having pain with exercise, PT helps with that too. Um, and there's all kinds of different forms of exercise. I recommend you find something that you enjoy. Walking is great. Might start getting a little too hot out for that um, soon. Um, hormone replacement. So that's the big question. There's a lot of benefits to hormone replacement and there are lots of different forms of hormone replacement. So it's good to discuss with your doctor. The benefits are hot flashes and night sweats can be mitigated with that. It helps a lot with vaginal dry, dryness and the atrophic changes that I've been talking to you about. It helps with skin changes all over your body, um, helps with that atrophic vaginitis, and it helps with preventing osteoporosis. Um, there are risks to hormone replacement therapy as with any effective therapy. Uh, Breast cancer and ovarian cancer, people that have that, um, there's some risk with those. So, of course, you'll be talking to your doctor about hormone replacement, and you can um, check into that. Uh, there's also a little bit higher risk of thromboembolic disease or blood clots, which then can lead to stroke. Um, also, pancreatitis, which is pretty painful inflammation of the pancreas, and especially it's at risk if you have high triglyceride levels. And cholecystitis, which is um, gallstones or gallbladder irritation, is also another risk. Um, the risks and benefits should be discussed with your physician to determine what's the best therapy for you uh, based on your individual medical history. And there are other ways to treat symptoms if you cannot do hormone replacement therapy. So um, please look into that. If you're one of the people that, that it's not a good idea for, there's still treatments out there for you. So what are the benefits of physical therapy? We address pelvic muscle function and dysfunction. We address voiding issues, um, urinary and bowel. We do a thorough medical history to determine your best referral. And we address general deconditioning and joint pain and can help you get into an exercise routine that's enjoyable and feels good to you. 
Um, we educate women about the changes of menopause, and we give them tools to be advocates for themselves and to be prepared to discuss issues with their physician that are often difficult or embarrassing to discuss. And we give women the terminology and tools to recognize what's not normal and how to talk with their provider about their issues. I hope this talk has given you a bit more knowledge about menopause, and we'd love to be a resource for you here at Foundational Concepts. I really hope you now feel more empowered to discuss menopausal symptoms with your doctor or provider and to ask what kind of treatment he or she recommends. Pelvic PT is a great tool throughout the lifespan, so I like to get me to women to see me in like prior to their first pregnancy, but really any point in your journey is going to be a great place to start, even if it's even if you've been postmenopausal in your, your 80s, okay, um, we can help and make some improvements for you. This is our contact info. Um, this again, Sarah and Jennifer are the owners. There's a phone number there if you want to take a screenshot of that. Um, and th those are their, their um, email addresses. Also, we have a, a nice little website, www.foundationalconcepts.com. And if you call us, we can also, if you're curious if pelvic floor therapy is right for you or you have concerns about pelvic floor therapy and wanna ask some more questions of one of our therapists, you can set up a free 15 minute phone consult. And we also have a nice little blog on our webpage that's searchable. So it's got a whole bunch of different information on there about pelvic floor therapy too, if you'd like to lurk around in there. Another thing I wanna mention, I don't have it on a slide, um, which is a great resource too for some general information. And it's called the North American Menopause Society. And they're their web address is www.menopause.org. And uh, I find them to have a lot of good general information. Um, they tend to recommend yoga for everything because I think it's just a good starting place for people that don't have access to physical therapy. And it does give some core training, but um, it's not really the gold standard, but it's nice that they're offering some kind of exercise advice on there too. And there's a lot of really good advice on there. Um, now, let me come on here and say hi. Oh, here we go. So I just wanted to see if anybody had any, any questions for me or if you all got your questions answered already while I was giving my talk. Oh, here's the chat. Let me see if I can figure this out. Okay. Well, if we don't have any other questions, no further ado. Um, oh, wait, is there new phone number? Oh, thank you. Yeah, check the new phone number on there. Sorry about that. I, I should have double checked that. But our web address still is foundationalconcepts.com. And I know they keep that information on there updated. And we also have location. We have um, Brookside location, which is where Julie and I are. And we have a location in Overland Park at about 121st and Metcalf. And we have a location in North Kansas City, Missouri. And we have um, also a little bit like a one week or one day week in Atchison. So um, we're growing a little bit and trying to reach people at different corners of our little Kansas City area world here. So um, thank you everyone for joining me. Um, I hope this was helpful for you and uh, I hope you have a, a nice evening. Good night and thank you.